Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers and this video is titled Tales from the Antenna Range. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I was lead engineer in the microwave technology group for the Boeing Military Aircraft Company in the early 80s out of Wichita, Kansas. And although it was the, uh, my title was lead engineer of the microwave technology group, I actually was involved in essentially DC to light, we used to say. And one of the interesting things was when I was uh, involved as a lead engineer, I got to see the scheduling uh, sheet. And yeah, nothing fancy electronic. This was all on paper. Uh, we didn't have computers back then. Um, no internet. I tell you, this is the dark ages. Yes. So I saw the scheduling uh, sheet and it went out to four months and then it just stopped. And I go, oh my gosh, what is this? We're all out of a job in four months. And my boss says, no, 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 no. It, uh, we, we always get something new. And we always did. So that was good. But I worked on a number of projects. And one of them was a method of communicating in uh, very difficult times. And one of the ways you do that is by very low frequency uh, signals. Uh, high power, but low frequencies. And uh, you'd have aircraft like a KC-135 with the trailing wire antenna. And these antenna would go out sometimes 30,000 feet. Okay, we're talking almost six miles of wire. And the one I was working on was actually a dual wire setup, a longer one and a shorter one um, to, uh, to give you a little bit of directionality, if you will, uh, to kind of uh, uh, point the thing. Now, uh, the interesting uh, part about this was the uh, antenna tuner in there being very low frequency, of course, you had the transmitter and the tuner. The antenna tuner took up about half of the KC-135. And earlier in my career, when I was a pilot out at the flight test center in Edwards, we had some of these uh, 135s come out there for a test because you trail this wire out and you can have instabilities. That's why you have a cone there and just did it the wire. And of course, the cone helps pull it out. But the... Um, the wire could become unstable. So uh, you had to flight test it to make sure you didn't get any problems, and especially have you two wires. You didn't want them wrapping around each other. But they had a, a big note in test ops because we, you know, uh, we were boys with our toys and we had a little bit of tendency to sometimes jump other aircraft for fun. Let's put it that way. Um, and they said, do not jump the KC-135 because you're likely to tangle up in its antenna. Big warning. Don't do that. And there are a couple different ways to do trailing wire antennas. This one is, uh, uh, you, it actually stows away. Uh, you can hide it. And here's another position. So you just reel this thing out. When you want to come in and land, of course, you can't be trailing a six mile long wire. So you have to reel the back thing in. So that was an interesting uh, problem. Uh, one of many, and this was in uh, the very low frequency end of the spectrum. Now, one thing interesting about being on tech staff is you work a lot of issues. It never gets boring. Some of these projects literally can be a day or they can be months. I was sent for a week to Boeing Vertol out in Philadelphia. Now, that is the helicopter division that was responsible uh, in Boeing for developing the Osprey, the V-22. So I did the placement of all the antennas, the initial placement. I'm sure they moved things around. I did the initial placement of all the antennas on this aircraft. Of course, you have the UHF, the VHF, the HF, and there was a system for picking up a downed aviator, a bunch of antennas on the bottom where you could home in on them in essentially zero, zero weather conditions. So this was a real nice capability to pick, pick up a downed person or to extract people uh, by use of locator beacons. Another project I got to work on was we needed to put a SATCOM antenna on a KC-135, actually an EC, the electronic version of the 135. Now, no matter how big you make an aircraft, they will find a way to totally cover it with antennas. And I thought my initial thing on this was, ah, not a problem. I got a big aircraft. This is an 18-inch antenna. No problem. Well, in the end, to, uh, to put the antenna where I needed to put it, I had to move two other antennas. So that, that was kind of an unfortunate thing of, a, of having to put this on and move two, but uh, it's what you needed to do. It's a crowded airplane. Now, one little fun fact is a lot of the people in our group uh, 
were ham radio operators. And I'm a ham radio operator, KC0ZN. I've been one since uh, the late 70s. I'm extra class. And my station has been dormant for about the last 25 years. I live on a very small lot, and it wasn't conducive to putting up a decent antenna. So I, I've got a location here where I can put up an antenna um, off-site, let's call it that, uh, on some property uh, that I have. And uh, it doesn't quite look like it, but uh, we're up at 50 feet here. That's me on the left and Ken on the right, uh, putting together the, uh, the antenna, raising it up. And there's me. You know, when you get to be 73, you still need to have a lot of fun and uh, play with heights and stuff like that. And this is the finished product of the antenna with a uh, two meter vertical, a 11 element two meter beam, and then for people who know about ham radio, a Mosley TA33 three element beam good for 10, 15, and 20 meters. And there's my ham station in quite a bit of disarray. I've just kind of put stuff there and uh, going to be setting it up. But uh, that's one of my nice retirement projects. Oh, on the uh, on the side there, there's a homebrew linear and a Johnson Viking Thunderbolt two kilowatt linear. So that's my uh, retirement hobby. Thanks for watching.